can get my video going. Uh, right, we are now uh, live on uh, YouTube. Yeah? Um, all right, um, it's already 10. Uh, I think we can start now, uh, Prof. Azizuddin. Okay, uh, Assalamualaikum and very good morning, afternoon, and also evening to everybody, wherever you are, who are watching uh, this uh, program this morning in Malaysia. So, this is, I think, a very fortunate for us uh, to discuss uh, the topic, which is, I think, uh, this forum is about uh, Afghanistan. Eh? which uh, entitled Afghanistan in Regional uh, Geopolitics, uh, what is happening and what are the stakes. So this program actually brought uh, to uh, all of us yeah, uh, by academic uh, of Professor of Malaysia. Uh, as we know that uh, last month, yeah, uh, on the 31st yeah, August, we can see uh, the last yeah, uh, military personnel from the United States leaving Afghanistan. And, and uh, it was, uh, it's also a turning point uh, for us to see uh, the, the Taliban uh, came back uh, uh, to power uh, in Afghanistan, which is, I think, uh, if we follow through the, the history of Afghanistan, you can see that, you know, uh, how, you know, um, the incidents of 9-11, uh, 2001, actually a trigger point uh, for, the, for the history of Afghanistan when we can see that uh, how... Uh, the Taliban, who actually happened to be the 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 the, uh, the ruler or the the, uh, the, the regime uh, that uh, led Afghanistan since 1996, uh, that was uh, was brought down in 2001, and uh, since uh, 9/11, uh, and I think actually I think if you all follow through the, the history, when uh, the Taliban who was in power back then, uh, give a safe haven uh, to the Al Qaeda and all terrorist groups. Uh, who happened to be uh, or been accused, eh, who committed uh, the crime in, uh, in New York and also uh, Washington in 2001. Eh? So because of that, eh, uh, with the collective effort by the states eh, and together with uh, the nations eh, uh, through resolution eh, 1441, uh, uh, that I think uh, is it earlier, eh? 1441 is a, a different uh, resolution, but earlier, decided uh, to 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 uh, to invade uh, afghanistan okay since then i think you can see that uh, there's a ongoing uh, war uh, with taliban even though we can see there's a uh, you know emerging of democracy uh, yeah, in afghanistan until you know uh, it's shocking everybody uh, last month when there's a chaotic scene uh, you can see to uh, news media where uh, uh, everybody eh, uh, you know, rushing, uh, leaving Afghanistan in the airport, uh, in Kabul airport, and also and and uh, 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 Taliban uh, managed to uh, uh, managed to take over uh, back uh, uh, the government of uh, Afghanistan. So the, the big question is what is going on? Uh, what's really happened uh, uh, behind the scenes, uh, which we don't know. Uh. Uh, for those who follow uh, uh, closely what's going on in Afghanistan, probably you notice uh, since last year there's an agreement uh, in Doha. Uh, between uh, the United States eh, and also Taliban, and they're able to reach an agreement to, you know, to 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 exchange power, meaning that to 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 allow eh, uh, Taliban to take over Afghanistan. Eh? Supposedly on first uh, March uh, two thousand twenty one, eh? but uh, what's happened actually by August uh, last month eh, actually is a, a delay actually, eh, of the take over, uh, taking over eh, of Taliban to uh, in Afghanistan. Eh? So, but uh, in order to, to enlighten us, eh, in order to enlighten us what's going on, particularly the, the viewers from Malaysia, which are so following this issue very closely, eh, uh, uh, academic professor of Malaysia brought to you uh, three learned eh, uh, professors eh, in their own field, you know, to, to discuss with us uh, and explain to us you know, uh, what's really happened uh, in Afghanistan and what's going to happen in the future eh, to Afghanistan also, Afghanistan, uh, to the you know Afghanistan people, eh? so uh, we have with us eh, three, uh, three, uh, uh, three panelists. Eh? Uh, first, I think uh, I will introduce to you eh, 
is uh, professor uh, emeritus professor dr johan saramana mutu eh dia seorang profesor in uh, so, uh, in uh, radialana school of international studies nanyang tadi university eh singapore eh and also a fellow eh of academic of professor malaysia eh uh, the second uh, panelist eh is a uh, professor dr dr rashila ramli is a former director of institute of nation international study university kebangsaan malaysia and uh, the last eh uh, the third eh? Uh, uh, panelist is Professor Dr. Ahmad Fauzi Abdul Hamid eh, from School of Distant uh, Education, University of Science Malaysia. Eh. Uh, I think without further ado, eh, uh, I want to invite eh, um, Prof. Johan. Hopefully you can... Prof. Johan, are you there right now? Um, probably we can start with you to do the presentation. Eh. So before, uh, before... I'm here. Yeah, okay. Uh, before we start... Eh, Uh, before I pass uh, the session to you, just to explain a few other details. Eh? Uh, it's going to be a uh, uh, three round eh, of the discussion. First, I uh, will let uh, each one of the panelists to to do the presentation uh, uh, for uh, for about 10 to 12 minutes. The most is 15 minutes. Eh? Each one of you. Then after that, uh, once we finish all three presentations, you know, uh, I will start uh, to ask question. Then we are going to enter second. Uh, second round uh, and I ask question to each one of you as well then after that uh, we're going to open uh, to our audience eh? viewers eh? Uh, which uh, uh, as we know that uh, inside, uh, we use the platform of zoom we also uh, you know we have um, viewers from YouTube eh? which uh, I think uh, if anyone eh, later on in the third round uh, anyone want to ask question uh, to the panelists I think you can you know type on your chat box eh? Uh, in order for for us to get your question and so and so I also can you know start uh, asking the panelists yeah, uh, based on their questions yeah. and for those from uh, from Zoom you know uh, because you already uh, together with us yeah, in this uh, platform uh, you actually can also ask question yeah, by raising your hand and then also uh, ask question straight away uh, to the panelists yeah. so I think uh, yeah uh, I pass to you yeah, uh, Prof Johan Yes. Uh, for, to begin your presentation, so please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, salam sejahtera, everybody. Uh, a very, very good morning to you. Uh, I'm speaking from Singapore. Unfortunately, I have some problems, uh, technical problems with my video. Uh, so uh, I don't think you can see me. Uh, can you all see me? No, but you can hear me. Yeah. yeah. I, Unfortunately, I'm sorry about this. I've been clicking on this and it doesn't work. But I think I won't waste more time. Uh, Cik Zaharul, if you have my PowerPoint, perhaps you can start. Yeah. Uh, from the first slide. Yes. This is not it. Yeah, this is it. Yeah, right from the start. Ah, yes. Well, um, go, go to the next one. So basically, Uh, this is the uh, very just to give you an idea of I'm I'm talking about the geopolitics and the implications of what I would call the Afghan debacle. Uh, it is actually quite quite uh, uh, you know a disaster from a certain point of view in terms of U.S. foreign policy, uh, also from a regional perspective. So I'll begin with that preamble to say that uh, you know what has happened in Afghanistan has been I think a major. Uh, issue for the world and for the region in, 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 in region of South Asia as well as Southeast Asia and the rest of the world. So we look at Afghanistan as a landlocked country. Uh, it's uh, it's been uh, around for many many centuries, uh, but the particular shape it takes, of course, is the, is a function of uh, colonialism. Uh, and if you look at the broader picture, Afghanistan, of course, is part of the South uh, Asia region. Uh, but it's nestled between the Middle East, uh, South Asia, you have the Indian Ocean there. So it's a very strategic spot, I think, uh, in the world. Uh, let's move on further to the points that I'm going to make. Next slide, Zaharo, please. Next slide. So it, Afghanistan has been dubbed the graveyard, the graveyard of empires. I mean, for good reason. I mean, the Persians, the Mughals, the Mo The Mongols, the Russians, the British, all of them came by, came, and uh, they were unsuccessful in their venture. So, you know, it's a very long story. The most recent uh, contemporary development was called the Soviet Union, 
uh, which was uh, had occupied uh, Afghanistan from 79 to 89. Uh, and that also ended, uh, you know, uh, not very well for the Soviet Union. And that's when the uh, United States of America, together with its NATO allies, decided to take on the job, as it were, uh, you know, uh, based uh, on the idea of the war on terror, which was a development from the 9-11. I, there's so many things to talk about. So let's just focus on this particular one. Uh, and the idea was that it was, uh, you know, a terrain for the Al-Qaeda to operate. The U.S. was going in there to stop this uh, war, uh, to start to begin their war on terror. Uh, so Afghanistan uh, dates back to 2001. Uh, and of course, it's the longest war for the U.S. And the U.S. has just left after 20 years. Um, there was the killing of Osama bin Laden, uh, who was the, the, the man behind Al-Qaeda. Uh, that occurred in the Obama administration uh, in 2011, but it didn't happen in Afghanistan, it happened in Pakistan. So all these were related to the Afghanistan story. Uh, the little uh, insert on the site tells you the cost of the war. Uh, this was an expensive war, perhaps not as expensive as uh, Iraq. Uh, which cost the U.S. something like $3 trillion, uh, in terms of money and lives, uh, you know, probably in the millions. Uh, but in the case of Afghanistan, uh, the project but at Brown University uh, yeah, has given us the figures here, 176,000 people uh, were killed, uh, including civilians and, uh, and military personnel. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a very sad, uh, you know, story. Uh, a lot of uh, effort, money, uh, lives have been expended in Afghanistan, and we see uh, it end in a, basically, I would say, uh, a failure of the U.S. Uh, uh, project and the Western project, uh, you know, for, for bringing about a, a, a modicum of peace in the region. Now, what are the implications immediately, one can say? It, possibly uh, the end of these uh, neocon projects. Uh, long story again, neoconservative you know, uh, philosophy or, or ideas have been in US foreign policy for a long time. And actually there's hardly any difference between the Democrats and the Republicans if you ask me in terms of the kinds of uh, you know, uh, uh, global adventures they, they, they sort of get involved in. Uh, essentially is to establish US hegemony across the globe. Uh, the, the Afghan war was indeed a NATO operation, but NATO sort of uh, in 2015 reduced its commitment militarily. Uh, so overall, you know, these are the points that I'm, I'm just putting, I'm just throwing out as ideas or points for discussion. Is this uh, a Western hegemony in retreat? Uh, the end of the idea of having client states for, for the US uh, and this idea of hegemonic stability as a concept in political economy. Um, uh, which says that you have to have one hegemon, one major power to underpin the economic uh, and the global order. Uh, so is this a kind of a statement that, uh, or symbolic of a change uh, in the manner in which hegemony or global hegemony is being uh, ordered today in the world? I would say it leads to certain, uh, many, many questions, but uh, we, can, we can have further discussion about it. Can I have the next slide here? Yeah. Zaharo, next slide. Um, yeah, these are just uh, figures. Uh, you can pull them out from anywhere, but uh, this is the BBC one. To show that there has actually been, a, a, you know, in terms of the Afghan war, by 2020, America was ready to give up. Huh? Uh, in fact, the, uh, the, the peace accord was, uh, was uh, negotiated by the Trump administration. So it was a Trump agenda uh, that brought an end to the Af Afghan war in February of 2020. Next slide. Next slide, yeah. And in a way, uh, you look at US foreign policy overall in this uh, area, which is called, Sen, Sen, uh, they call it the US CENTCOM, uh, which includes Afghanistan. You, you know, in terms of the kinds of commitments that the US made in terms of their military commitments, uh, it was already drawing down. You know? But Afghanistan remained the major one, as you can say, total contractors. The use of contractors also is an important sort of uh, offshoot of US foreign policy since Vietnam, right? Uh, so 26,000, so it was the major one, but as, as, as is stated here, yeah. Uh, well, the next slide, we'll, we'll give you a, a little bit more. Next slide. Uh, the, the final kind of blitz was carried out in, in, during the Trump period, 
uh, before they, they struck uh, this uh, peace accord with the Taliban, agreeing to a full withdrawal of US troops from Afghanistan. So it's not a Biden policy, by the way. So it's actually a Trump uh, administration policy. So the, the weapon releases were, you know, were at the peak uh, at the end of 20, 2019. However, Blinken last night in his uh, grilling, grilling by the Senate uh, said that there are still about 80 billion worth of weaponry that's left in Afghanistan now, which the Taliban can sort of uh, make use of. Next. Ah, US spending uh, is already basically, I think it's almost a billion, 800, so, uh, sorry, almost a trillion. Uh, in terms of the, you know, the 20 years or so. So wars are very, very expensive, not just in terms of lives, but in terms of the money that we spend uh, in, in these wars. Next. Now, so let me just talk broadly now of the uh, US foreign policy uh, and, and how it has been sort of shifting or changing. And then uh, we get to the Biden period. Uh, so essentially, if you take it back uh, geopolitically to the period, of the Nixon Doctrine. Nixon Doctrine was uh, expounded immediately after Vietnam, which was a, another major debacle for the US, as we all know, right? We don't have to get into that. And actually the scenes that you see in Afghanistan, uh, you know, it, 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 this, this last month, uh, was very similar to what happened in Vietnam in 1975. Uh, the, the, the kind of, uh, uh, you know, chaos that occurred, you know? Uh, so similar, except I think uh, Blinken is trying to say that it was very well organized. They managed to pull out about 124,000 uh, people, right? Uh, maybe a little better than Vietnam, but it, it essentially still a mess, you know? Uh, so as a result of that, uh, we had the, uh, the Guam Doctrine or the Nixon Doctrine, which was, uh, uh, in fact, it was supposed to be practiced in Afghanistan, Vietnamization, which means that you allow the war to be, to be sort of carried out or to be conducted by the locals, not by America. America provides the, the, you know, the support, the military, as well as the financial support. Uh, so no more boots on the ground, as it were, after Vietnam. However, this immediately changed after the war on terror was declared after 9-11, and the US began to be involved again in, in many, many uh, other, you know, uh, especially Iraq in 2003. Libya, uh, more, more recently, Yemen is a continuing operation, although there are no real boots on the ground. The Saudi is the one, uh, Saudi, uh, it's the Saudi forces are the one taking the, up the Tajus there. Uh, so this change occurred without that being what, what we in foreign policy and our analysts call a doctrine. There was no real change in terms of a doctrine. The war on terror, I suppose, is a kind of a foreign policy doctrine. Then you had the soft approach of Obama, uh, the pivot to Asia, uh, you know, uh, no particular, uh, the war on terror continued as it were. After all, he was the one that's responsible for, for the assassination of Obama and Bin Laden. Uh, but the idea that you have soft power, you know, you don't have to have uh, military engagements in the same sort of way that you used to in the past, uh, that kind of policy uh, more or less uh, cohered during the period of Obama. Although America was still very active across the globe, right? Uh, so, as I said, there's no real difference between Democrats and, and Republicans in terms of actual foreign policy. Uh, then you had a very a major shift, you might say, in, in, in the Trump's uh, policy since 2016, uh, where he basically said we must get out of all these engagements, right? Uh, so it was almost back to the Nixon doctrine kind of idea, no boots on the ground. And Afghanistan was one of the, uh, the results of that uh, that policy. And Trump uh, proposed this large uh, concept of the free and open Indo-Pacific uh, in 2017. Uh, and the idea was to contain China as well as to take care of all the American uh, and, and Western interests in the region. Uh, and for South Asia, it was the use of the Quad powers, the US, Japan, India, and Australia. So, so uh, ironically, it's the Trump administration that actually has uh, has been the prelude to this current phase, uh, which sees the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Next, please. How, is, how am I doing for time? I think I'm okay. Yes, thank you. So there's a suggestion that um, we are maybe in an era of a Biden doctrine, 
But uh, if you read the thing on the side there, Biden doctrine, uh, this is, uh, I, I, I take this from the uh, New York Times, a foreign policy that avoids the aggressive tactics of long wars and nation building, that's an important concept. Actually, Trump was already talking about that. While uniting allies against the authoritarianism of rising powers. And the Biden doctrine also sees China as America's existential competitor, Russia as a disruptor, Iran and North Korea as uh, nuclear proliferators, cyber threats as an ever evolving, as ever evolving, and terrorism as spreading far beyond Afghanistan. So taking care of Afghanistan alone is, isn't enough. Uh, you have to have a larger sort of canvas to attack uh, this problem. Uh, uh, but for me, I think uh, this this is what is said to be a Biden doctrine. But I put a question mark there. I know it's very it is in fact really a doctrine. But the fact of the matter is that I think for now, it appears that America doesn't have the appetite uh, to carry out what is called nation building anymore, right? It's leaving, leaving you guys to do your own thing, as it were. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, we're not interested in, in, in trying to build democratic regimes anymore, uh, to set up democratic regimes. Um, and essentially, um, I would say, um, Biden has also embraced the idea of China being the major, major issue for, for the US foreign policy and presumably for the West. Uh, China is the new enemy now, right? It used to be Russia and so on. So that's the new one. Uh, so we, we, we are worried about China. Let's focus our attention on China and all the containment policies are directed down now China. Maybe don't, don't worry so much about these uh, wars in the third world. Uh, and so in a way, the Afghan war is a marker uh, for me, it is a marker. Uh, perhaps you call it, a, you could call it a game-changing event, but it also already things were already happening prior to Afghanistan. Uh, ironically, again, I said Trump was the one that started all this. All this. Uh, maybe it's not ironic. Uh, it's you know, America was already moving in that particular direction. Um, but it is a game changer in the sense that it may lead to the D and this is basically my major final point, which is what I was supposed to talk about anyway, uh, destabilization of geopolitics in the subcontinent uh, and across uh, most of Asia, I would say. Uh, we already have a very, very unstable region in, in South Asia, uh, be it Pakistan, Kashmir, and of course, we go further, you have Xinjiang, which is not exactly unstable, but it is related to the, all the issues of Central Asian, South Asian uh, Islamic insurgencies. A uh, lot of issues to be covered here, and we can have a uh, discussion during, uh, during uh, question time. So it does raise also the, the final question for me about the, 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 the reliability of the US as an ally today, right? I mean, we have uh, our representative from uh, Afghanistan sitting there, uh, you know, <laughs> you can tell us a few more things, uh, but it does really. I mean, what a sudden withdrawal without, I mean, it's almost irresponsible, isn't it? It is irresponsible uh, to do this sort of very uh, sudden withdrawal uh, without even properly preparing as Blinken was uh, being quick grilled uh, yesterday. Uh, it appeared that the Biden administration was not prepared for the things that happened, including the 13 the final, you know, the, the, the debacle that occurred at the end, the debacle that occurred at the end with the 13 US troops and, and how many Afghans people, how many Afghanistans were killed? I can't remember Afghan people, a larger number. Next. The last slide, I think. It's not the last slide, that's one more slide. I think I'm still within my time. Uh, so there are many, many questions, uh, as I said, and you can just read those things and reflect on them. Um, we do have a new Taliban government, so we have a new regime. Uh, there are still uh, ongoing talks, uh, uh, national re uh, reconciliation talks going on in Qatar, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so previous uh, Afghan leaders like uh, Hamid Kazai and Abdullah Abdullah are involved in these uh, discussions. Uh, but exactly how they will, will finally uh, you know, uh, gel, we don't know. Uh, this, this, of course, has all kinds of implications for conflicts post, uh, you know, uh, in, under the Taliban regime, because as we know, Afghanistan is, is a very is a plural society. There are many groups uh, and there are still insurgencies. 
And then if you look at it regionally, you have the problem of uh, terrorists or groups uh, maybe uh, regrouping. Al Qaeda is said to be reviving, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, been reading some of this. Uh, I'm not an expert in this area at all, but the people who write about this region are saying that you're going to see this development. And for China, the major one is the East Turkestan uh, Islamic movement, which is linked to the Uyghurs uh, in Xinjiang. They're very concerned about that because they are the ones that are involved in the and uh, creating a separate state uh, in, uh, for, for in, in, in the Xinjiang province, right? Uh, then uh, there are implications for Southeast Asia. Maybe we can take that at the uh, Q&A. What are the implications for US foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Southeast Asia in, 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 with the backdrop of Afghanistan? And there is a very important implication, which I will go on in the final slide, which is that China, I think, uh, is probably, if you want to think of it that way, a beneficiary of this. Uh, you know, uh, with the, the vac a vacuum created in South, South Asia now, uh, I think China will rise to the occasion. And then it has implications for in, uh, the continuing India-Pakistan conflicts, uh, whether it's in Kashmir or elsewhere, uh, and also has implications for China-India relations. And finally, the final slide, I think I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, so the, the, the rise of China and the importance of China, I think, uh, will be uh, amplified as a result of uh, Afghanistan. In fact, uh, the Taliban regime is already talking. And I, is it the 31 million has already been uh, agreed to, uh, Chinese, uh, to? The Chinese have agreed. Uh, China has agreed to give 31 million. So we have this uh, a Belt and Road Initiative, which is already uh, already present in Afghan, uh, in in Pakistan, mind you, it has uh, issues. Not to say that it's moving on so smoothly, but you can see it's a major project, and you, we 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 know all about China's Belt and Road Initiative in Southeast Asia as well, right? So, uh, so this gives an opportunity, I think, a unique opportunity for China to now re to establish itself uh, even more uh, more strongly. Uh, as the, the two points I'm making on the side there is from the diplomat. Uh, uh, it's important. I think uh, it, we will see certain developments in this direction in the future in Afghanistan. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Thank you, uh, Prabhu Han. Eh? I think you cleverly explained eh, the historical background eh, of the, the crisis eh, in Afghanistan and also explained to us eh, with regard to US foreign policy, why there's a the big question is why there's a sudden, sudden change of the policy during Trump eh, uh, to, to, to come up with the, with the peaceful resolution, uh, resolution eh, with the Taliban. Mm -hmm. eh? mm -hmm. And uh, after uh, the last point I think you made uh, regarding the, the impact probably eh, would bring uh, you know, to, to the regional aspect eh, with the China coming in and also Russia coming in. I think you know, uh, it gives us sudden probably eh, uh, a change of uh, makeup eh, of the conflict yeah. or even crisis uh, in those, uh, in, in that region. Eh? So uh, I, I think I have, I have several questions to ask you. I think I just uh, reserved my question yet. Eh? I, I want to now uh, move to the second uh, panel, uh, panel uh, Prof. Sheila. Eh? So that, uh, what you take eh, uh, from the, the crisis eh, in overall, eh? and uh, probably you can you know, add some more uh, perspective eh, uh, on this issue, particularly on in the matters of uh, you know, uh, humanitarian uh, situation in Afghanistan right now. So I pass, pass to you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Azizuddin. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you so much to Academy Professor for giving me the opportunity to, to make a short presentation to, to be part of your program uh, this morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera. And a very good morning, good afternoon, as well as good evening, depending on the location. I think that's the normal greeting that we have nowadays yeah, under the new environment that we are in. Uh, yes. So, uh, as mentioned by uh, Prof. Azizuddin just now, uh, I, I actually will, I will take it more from a humanitarian perspective. And, and in order to do that, uh, I will share with you some of my, uh, I will share with you my slides right now. Okay, uh, let me put it on the big picture. Slideshow. Okay, so, um, yeah. Um, 
as uh, I'm so lucky because I'm speaking after Prof Johan because yeah. what he has done is to give a background and to also tie it into what is normally known more of a uh, the traditional security perspective uh, within uh, international relations, you know, the field of, uh, the, of, of realism. So what I would like to do is actually to look into two things, the link between um, security and development. And in order to do so, I will take a more of human security perspective, which allows me to tie into the humanitarian aspect, a crisis which is going on in uh, Afghanistan. Plus, and by doing so also, I'm, I will be able to highlight, I think, the roles of uh, multi-stakeholders. Uh, we do have, of course, now the new government of uh, Taliban. We have uh, the international players. Uh, we have NATO. We have international NGOs, for example, the World Food Program. Uh, we're looking into the number of UN agencies which are also involved in UNICEF as well as uh, UN uh, uh, the, the HR as well. So you're looking at all the different players uh, in play in, in, in this, uh, in, in this uh, uh, situation. Okay. All right, so within uh, security and development, what happened is usually security, well, not usually, before this, Security and development are studied separately, almost as two different, uh, two different branches of, uh, of, uh, of knowledge that we would like to acquire. However, as the world becomes more globalized, as the world becomes more connected, the issue of security and development needs to be looked into uh, in a more interconnected uh, situation. Yeah? Before in security, we talk about traditional security, non-traditional security, and uh, in the 90s, the issue of uh, the, the, the perspective on human sec security came into place, where, where there are three elements that we can focus on. Freedom from fear, freedom from one, and freedom from indignity. So these three elements are important in our discussion. On the other hand, we have development, and this has been measured in many terms, usually measured by the economic terms. Uh, sometimes way back, we talk about stages of growth. We talk about dependent development or under dependent development. And since 2015, we have the Global Agenda 2020, which is on sustainable development goals. So that should be going on until, until, uh, until 2030. So, what kind of linkages do we have? Which, which one comes first? Actually, there are interlink, interlinks. So that's why I put the, the two arrows here. Yeah? Security fits into development. Development fits into security. So these are some of the things that we need to bear in mind when we, uh, when we have our discussion today. Now, two reports that I look at, the 2020 uh, Human Development Index report, and also the 2021 uh, Global uh, Peace Index uh, of 2021. So these are the two, you know, they, uh, with, with the Human Development Index, uh, it has been there since the data has been collected since 1990. Whereas with Global Peace Index, I believe it was from 2007. So it's a little earlier, uh, I mean, a little later. So using documents from these two, I would like to share with you yeah, the over, overall human development, uh, human security definition, yeah, it relates to all things that men and women cherish, enough food for the children, adequate shelter, good health, uh, schooling, uh, protection from violence inflicted by men or nature, and a state that does not oppress its citizens but rules with their consent. So this came out from 1999 and is still valid. And there are many, there are about seven to nine categories uh, that we can go, we can go into it. So within the Human Development Index, this is for 2020, and uh, I just we're just looking at the trend for the since the time when the when US came into Afghanistan, yeah, from the year 2020. You can see that life expectancy since birth have grown actually from the age of 55. So now 
longevity overall is about 64.8 in Afghanistan. Now, expected years of schooling, yeah, from the year 20, uh, the year 2000, it was only about six children are staying in school for only about six years. But expected schooling right now is about 10 years. However, the average uh, means of schooling is only at about four years. Yeah, And uh, and if you notice, from 2015 until 2019 or 2020, so to speak, the gross, gross national income for the country has pretty much stagnant at about 2,200 2, in the past uh, five years. Uh, so there's not been much of a growth at that point. The growth is being measured by income for the country. Yeah? There are other ways to measure income. So at the GDP, uh, so overall, uh, human development index is at 0 0.511. So these are the trends. You can look at this again. Uh, time flies, you know, when we are having a discussion here. Okay, so you can see that uh, life expectancy, the, the light blue color, and then you have the G, uh, GNI, the, the national income which dip down and pretty much remain stagnant and the age of education. However, when we disaggregate the data, looking at it uh, from a gender equality perspective, when I say gender equality, we're not talking just about same, you know, same income. We're talking about uh, mm -hmm. substantive equality, equality in terms of access, equality in terms of opportunities, Equality in terms of resources. So substantive equalities cover all of this. Yeah? And in looking at this, if you look again at the, the one that I colored in red, where when, when it become between the boys and girls in Afghanistan, uh, expected years of schooling for girls are only about eight years, whereas for boys, male, usually about 12 years or so. And the mean years of schooling for female, it's only about two years, whereas for male, six years, yeah? And uh, overall, uh, G, uh, the gross national income, actually, we're looking at um, the, the, the men earning about four times more compared to, to women in Afghanistan. These are the data uh, that is shown. Furthermore, in the gender inequality uh, index, we also see... Uh, um, the, the numbers in terms of uh, population of this uh, secondary school education is about one third female compared to the male. And also in labor force participation, because th this makes a lot of difference in terms of the development of the country in the long run. So, the, the, so this, some findings from the Human Development Index shows that yes, although HDI has increased, uh, is still listed as least developed state. So, although, and, and we do see that children are staying longer in school, although it's not enough. And the fact that the, the gross national income has increased, increased. However, girls spend an average of only two years in school compared to six based on the data and only about 30% labor force participation. Uh, with about that, women earn about only 25% of the income compared to men. Now, I'm going to touch a bit on the World Peace Global Peace Report, which, uh, which looks into three different domains here, yes? safety and security, ongoing, which has four, ten, 10 different variables. Then you have the ongoing conflict, about six, and then level of militarization, which looks into um, military expenditure. It looks into uh, access to weapons, for example. And in this report for Afghanistan, uh, the score goes from one to five. Yeah, one, uh, one being the, the most peaceful, five being the least peaceful. So at this point, out of the 163 uh, country, uh, uh, countries which are being uh, surveyed, uh, uh, it is sad to say, but yeah, uh, Afghanistan has the last uh, position at this point. And if you look at it closely, based on the indicators, the indicators. Uh, of uh, Global Peace Index looks for the absence of violence or fear of violence, yeah? 10 out of the 23 actually carry the maximum points of five, which is the highest point of violence or least of peace. And within the safety and security domain, 
uh, one of the biggest issue is about displaced people, internal displacement. So we're looking at uh, refugees, the refugees who are actually uh, Afghan themselves, who are being displaced because of the internal conflict. There's also a death from the conflict itself, and just now Prof. Uh, Johan showed the numbers of Afghan who have died in the last 10, 10 20 years, and then definitely uh, political instability because the governance which are in place, the government which are in place, the previous government, have not really put in the, the complete uh, structure uh, for, for good governance, yeah, in terms of the civil servant and, 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 and so on. Uh, so these are the things which we will need to discuss further. Um, and militarization, yeah, there is a, a very high access to weapons and also the military expenditure is very high. Okay. So it's not going. Okay. So these are just some pertinent information, you know, the, the, the border information, I think Prof. Johan has mentioned. The population some data shows 35, some says 38, so, but the literacy rate is only at 38%. So this has implications on uh, uh, human capital in the country. Uh, but the country has a very big number, 65% are actually under 25 years old. So it has a lot of energy, it has a lot of potential, and this is the one that needs to be harnessed for the development of the country. Okay. So humanitarian issue, I think we can discuss in maybe the next round. Three important ones, which are the food insecurity, issue of health, and definitely refugee crisis. So we will discuss that a little later. So once again, just to wrap up, as my time is almost done here, uh, within the development and security nexus, development can be seen as a conflict generating process leading towards insecurity, or development can be seen as a peace promoting process leading towards greater security. This is the balance that we're trying to see uh, in the, this particular juncture with the new uh, mm -hmm. government, the Taliban government. So I think with that, this is something we can discuss in terms of way forward. There are two different aspects. One, one is the context of uh, prevention, combines the promotion of condition conducive to peace and the prevention of conditions conducive to violence. So this was a, a, a perspective was, that was taken about 20 in, in 1990, but which it can still be very relevant at this point. And the issue of positive peace, where attitudes, in, uh, institution and structures are created and uh, that are being created and sustained in societies which is to maintain peace. So I think with that, I will finish my presentation at this point. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Rashila. I think you uh, brought some data which is very staggering uh, when seeing uh, what's happened in Afghanistan and what to expect in the future. Uh, no wonder uh, the heavy weight arrest, uh, Secretary General of the Nation, even argue that uh, I think Afghanistan require uh, some amount of about 600 million eh, in order to, to you know, build up eh, the country eh, for the beginning. Eh. Uh, that one probably requires some more funding eh, for that. Eh. So uh, now I think I want to go to uh, Prof. Fauzi, eh, uh, which I think you will uh, explain further more eh, regarding Taliban, eh, uh, whether the regime itself is the same regime or but according to them, there are different kind of Taliban. Eh. Uh, unlike in 1996 and also 2001. Yeah? So what you take on this yeah? and how you can expect uh, Taliban's rule in Afghanistan in the future? The floor goes to you, Prof. Z. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Prof. Uh, Azizuddin. Okay, uh, uh, for sharing this uh, session. And uh, I'd like to thank the Academy of Professor Malaysia for the invitation and also a good warm welcome to my fellow panelists, okay, the respected uh, Emeritus Professor Johan Saravanamutu and also to Professor uh, Rashila from uh, UKM. Okay, I'll be uh, speaking uh, later more 
are relevant to my niche uh, area, okay, which is uh, Islamist uh, politics. Okay, and before that, if I were to criticize the APM for this panel, is all contains all political scientists, okay, rather than having a combination of social scientists of other disciplines. And sometimes this is very boring, okay, because uh, you get a particular skewed view of political scientists. And political scientists are very boring people. I remember Prof. Shamsul Amri once saying that because political scientists are people who write in hotel rooms, okay, and in contrast with anthropologists, they write in the field. So we are we are boring uh, species of academics, <laughs> but but anyway, this is the invitation list. So uh, we'll see. I, I'll be I'll, so you know to to add also some source of dif difference to, to this uh, um, to, uh, to this uh, discussion. Okay, I'll be speaking uh, more later on politics and religion or, or Islamist politics, which is my, which is my uh, field of specialization. Okay, next, please, Zaro. Okay, um, I think Prof. Johan has mentioned uh, in detail, okay, and these are some uh, just uh, estimate figures based also on uh, research by Brown University, which Prof. Johan mentioned. Then Prof. Johan has uh, quoted the exact figures. Okay, some of these figures are estimates. But just uh, so that we can get um, an idea of how costly, okay, this at Afghan venture has been, not just for the government, but rather for the American people, is that USD to about two trillion, which is equivalent to three hundred million dollars per day, okay, or fifty thousand USD per uh, Afghani, okay, from a, an Afghan population of approximately forty million. Okay. And in, in fact, the cost of this Afghan venture, okay, is more than the net worth of Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, and the thirty richest billionaires. U.S. billionaires put together. Okay, it is at that costly as that. Uh, there are figures of deaths. Okay, and to top it, to, to top it all, uh, most of it is financed by borrowing. Okay, American being the largest detonation uh, in, in the world, and it is estimated that five hundred uh, billion in uh, U.S. dollars in interest has been paid. Okay, and the interest on the war debt is estimated later, okay, to reach six point five uh, trillion, okay, which is twenty thousand USD per U.S. citizen. Okay, so it, it is that uh, expensive, and you can just okay imagine if you were an American citizen, would you uh, imagine okay, helping to uh, you know finance? Okay, uh, an overseas venture, okay, by uh, your government to something which uh, is not uh, necessarily uh, beneficial uh, to you. Ostensibly, okay, it was to uh, I mean to defeat terrorism it was part of the uh, global war on terror when the when Afghanistan okay was uh, accused. Okay, of hiding uh, or, or sheltering Osama bin Laden. Okay, next please, Daru. In uh, Afghanistan, and yet, if you look uh, at uh, some figures from a recent survey, and this was this is from the Washington Post, okay, in uh, 9th uh, September, there's been only a marginal. Um, uh, in, increase in the feeling of safety okay, among the Americans, okay, among the USA population. Yeah, a bit safer, but just a little bit. So is that, you know, just this little bit feeling of security, is it worth it? Okay, the time spent, the, the numbers of American lives uh, lost, okay, and then the 
uh, bad name okay, incurred by USA okay, as an occupying force okay, in uh, Afghanistan okay, among uh, the uh, Afghanis. Okay, they were supposed okay, because it, this was launched okay, when the, I think the neocons okay, during George W. Bush's uh, time was an influential force okay, in uh, American uh, government. Okay, but later, of course, there were changes of uh, governments and, and uh, so on. So it was supposed to be part of a civilizing uh, mission as well. But then it didn't, out to, it didn't turn out to be so. Okay, there was, uh, um, I think, an interview with, uh, between one of the American TV channels with Imran Khan okay, uh, at late July. And uh, America was blaming Pakistan for sheltering okay, terrorists okay, in Pakistan, Imran Khan okay, was, be, uh, was basically uh, refuting these arguments and saying that it was the USA who messed up the whole thing in Afghanistan. Okay, it was basically messed up the whole thing. And what was uh, supposed to be uh, a mission to aid okay, uh, I mean, uh, Afghanistan as well in terms of human rights, democracy, yes, you see some tangible results especially in Kabul, okay, but I think on, on, on the whole, uh, I mean, the departure of the Americans left a feeling of relief, okay, especially, especially among the uh, Af Afghanis who didn't benefit, especially those in the countryside, okay, in the Shintiland who didn't benefit okay, from uh, the past uh, 20 years. Okay, so, and, and if you look at uh, the first uh, table there from 2002 to 2021, you can see okay, the difference uh, between what Americans uh, feel, okay, whether okay, the uh, events of September 11 had changed the country for uh, the better, for all, for the worse. Okay? Whereas 55% felt it was for the better in September 2002, Okay, but by September 2021, 20 years later, only 33% uh, percent, okay, uh, felt that the policies were for the better. Okay, next, please. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, um, so then we come to politics and religion, okay, which is the main thing that I'll be uh, touching on. Okay, relevant to my uh, expertise, and can I, and some of what I, I, I'll speak on, okay, I'll give the reference as well. Okay, you can get the slides later, I guess, from Academy Professor Malaysia. I'll refer first to Farish Noor's wonderful piece in Academia SG, 7 September, okay, which is, I think, the voice of uh, Singaporean academics. Farish Noor is an RSIS okay, with uh, Prof. Johan, okay, I believe, although both are Malaysian. And, you know, if, if you look at this uh, article, Farish goes on about, you know, the same old song of Muslim terrorism, okay, of uh, the links between Islam and terrorism reappearing again, this trope. And I quote from him here, since then, there has been there has emerged. Okay, this is since 9/11. Okay, a huge body of writing on Islam, okay, seen through the lens of security studies. Okay, uh, media reports, studies, surveys, and monographs. Interestingly, many stand apart from the work of, of other disciplines. Okay, and I was saying at the beginning, this is the problem of. Uh, political scientists like me and like all the panelists and like Farish Noor as well, who's also a, a political uh, scientist. That's why some of us, I mean, grow uh, bored of political science and go more to political anthropology, political history, okay, and uh, so on. Now, what is often called security studies emerged from another, emerged from a broader discipline of political science, but the views are all skewed. Okay, uh, and in some instances, in his, writes Farish Noor, okay, uh, these works bore the hallmarks of writings that pathologize Muslims 
and essentialize them in a reductive manner. And you see loads and a lot of writings, okay, especially in the internet, and especially written by so-called think tanks, okay, with um, instant experts, okay, uh, collecting information from here and there, from media reports and so on, and coming with some uh, tentative uh, conclusions. And these think tanks have funny names like international uh, security, uh, security agency, something, okay, giving a semblance of legitimacy. Yeah, but unfortunately, I think uh, the main weaknesses, as Farishnal points out here, is that you know the lack of diversity and the lack of a multidisciplinary um, and appreciation, lack of appreciation of disciplines other than security studies. So, as a result, governments you know, who take the cue, okay, who or who solicit advice okay, from these bodies, get a very skewed. A view okay, of uh, Muslims okay, on of Islamist uh, politics, and now we are getting all you know, especially in in the uh, media, okay, coming also from uh, India, especially which is being affected by you know uh, uh, Hindutva influence uh, government of uh, Taliban, okay, being the Bandi base and so on. The Bandis are terrorists and so on. I'll, I'll uh, go on to that later. Next, please. Okay, so if we look at Taliban uh, itself and to study Taliban okay, as a movement okay, which uh, you can say you call it Islamist, you can call it perhaps a, a militant, but these are some concepts okay, which you know, uh, the writers which I mentioned just now, okay, uh, they mix up all sorts of uh, concepts Okay, all sorts of um, labels without dissecting them. Okay, being uh, a particular group or a particular person being fundamentalist, literalist, or Salafist, what they mean by being Islamist, okay, by being extremist, by being a radical, by being jihadist, okay, and then uh, being a terrorist. So there are stages. If you look at the uh, literature systematically, okay, and for governments, it's very important to determine, okay, at what stage of a particular radicalization, okay, uh, steps of radicalization, okay, do you want to act on a person? Okay, if a person is merely an extremist in thought, okay, or being a radical Marxist just in thought, okay, uh, without uh, having any uh, movements or rebels. Okay, backing uh, him or her, is that necessarily a crime? Okay, the governments have to be okay, very aware, especially, especially uh, because we are in the age and day of um, in human rights. If a particular person or thinker wants to be a radical Marxist, even a radical Islamist, okay, whereas if you go uh, further towards being a radical, okay, which necessitates action and perhaps even further being a jihadist or even a terrorist okay uh, then governments have to deeper determine when and where and how to act and what about the question or the issue of non-violent extremism okay i'm i'm i'm, I'm uh, currently uh, working on something for the route handbook on non-violent extremism there are so many extremists but they are non-violent okay an extreme an extremist Need not necessarily be a terrorist, okay? Uh, but he, he's he's non-violent and he doesn't advocate violence. And uh, there are some categories of these people here, but still, they are extremists. Okay, uh, they are not pluralist, and 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 and, okay, and in fact, they uh, reject the idea of peaceful coexistence between different uh, ethnic groups, between different religions. And we see now that a lot of amateurish media uh, articles now pinpoint uh, this question of Diobandism and Diobandi Madrasas, okay, as if that is the origin of Taliban militancy 
on from one aspect yes because remember that during during the afghan during the afghan soviet war in the 1980s there were three million afghan refugees refugees and most of them were scattered along the afghan pakistan border Okay. And for these refugees, remember that even here in Malaysia, we have few refugees from the Rohingya community. It's not easy to send them to schools and so on. Okay. For these 3 million refugees, for their children, the madrasa education okay, was the only education that was, that was available to them. And most of the madrasas in Pakistan, 65% of the madrasas in Pakistan are Dilbandi operated. Okay, Adil Bandi operated 65%. That's the figure that I got to uh, reading okay, and so on. And at this time, uh, money from America came, and money from uh, Saudi came okay, and funneled uh, um, and benefited okay, uh, many of these madrasas. But are Adil Bandi necessarily violent? Are Adil Bandi necessarily militant? I mean, Tabriki Jamaat. Okay, and those who uh, I mean, have been to the UK, you know, the, the, the very big mosque at Dewsbury, <laughs> which I've also visited during my uh, student days. And then that's an offshoot of this Dilbandi uh, tradition. Okay, and scholars like Ashraf Ali Tandi, even Nick Aziz Nikmat, okay, went to Dil, uh, Darul Alam in Dilban. Okay, so if, if, if we start asking, well, well, what is this term of this group? Neo uh, Bandi. Now, in the subcontinent, two main groups of okay, uh, Muslim uh, activism: they are the Deobandis and the Barilvis. Okay, basically, it's okay, uh, to to put to put it uh, in general terms. Okay, it's almost similar to the Kaumuda versus Kaumtua. Okay, uh, split. In Malaysia, the Diobandis being the Kamuda and the uh, Barilvis okay, being the Kamtua. Okay. And in uh, 30 years ago, okay, when I went to Oxford, there were three mosques segregated. Okay, uh, one along linguistic lines, one Bangladeshi mosque, two Pakistani mosques. Okay, and the Pakistani mosque, one was Diobandi, one was Barilvi. It was separate, although both. Okay, or uh, Pakistani and Indian. Okay, and I would question, okay, if uh, people say that Dio Bandis are necessarily violent, because I actually live with them renting, okay, renting a uh, room with the Dio Bandi mosque, okay, in my, during my second and third year, okay, at, uh, at uh, Oxford. So I think these are just normal people, but this Dio Bandi tradition, okay, uh, the Obandi tradition is something very large. Some people do become violent, yes, of course. There are, uh, I mean, there exists um, and evidence okay, about this. Just like some, some Kaum, uh, Kaumuda, especially, they go on to become Salafis, but not all, or go, go on to become Salafi jihadists, okay, but not necessarily all. Okay, and there, there are several, I think, uh, sources uh, here. One by a, a scholar, uh, Brandon Ingram, who wrote actually a, a PhD thesis on uh, this uh, Dioban uh, movement. And I think this article from The Maiden is a uh, very good one. And he actually mentions that in his study, you know, I mean, this, the most people who are interested in, in this connection between the uh, Taliban and the, uh, to the Diobans, uh were journalists policy makers ngos but for the diobans themselves you know uh, whether the taliban uh, relates their origin to the diobandi movement and so on it's it, it, it's something of uh less of a concern okay to uh, diobandi himself okay next please Okay, so apart from the um, in religious factor, can I also mention then some of the other factors okay, uh, in the rise okay, of the Taliban? One is ethnic chauvinism, okay, and um, Afghanistan being 
uh, more than 95% Muslim country, I think. Okay, so when, when you get an all Muslim country, the problem arises okay, between particular ethnic groups. Okay, and Taliban is Pashtun dominated, uh, whereas there are other um, minorities, the Tajik. Okay, and some of the war, some of these warlords are actually from the minorities. Okay, you remember Ahmad Shah, Ahmad Shah Mas'ud, the Lion of Panjshir, okay, uh, who was one assassinated, one of the great warlords during the Soviet-Afghan War. He was a Tajik. Uh, and then Rashid Dastam, okay, another warlord, was, often, uh, was an Uzbek. And then there's also the Hazara Mosofuma Shiites. Okay, so Taliban operated also based on Asabia. Okay, and if we refer to the works of Ibn Khaldun, you can see how uh, Asabia you know, creates a sense of uh, belonging. Okay, and in fact, I would say that there is also a distant sense of superiority because in the Pashtun oral tradition, yeah, you know, they um, they have this view of their being or being uh, originated from the Bani Israel. And in fact, there's this uh, news in the Jerusalem Post, the 9th September, okay, also on this question okay, of whether the Pashtuns are actually the long lost distant cousins of uh, Israel. Okay, so there is this feeling, I think, which also contributes to uh, Asabia, to an air of superiority okay, of the Pashtuns. Okay. And then uh, the second factor I outlined here is corruption. Okay. And corruption, I think, has been identified, also mentioned by Prof. Johan just now. Okay. And in, if I uh, quote here from an article in, in Free Malaysia today, for years the government had been paying the salaries of 800 policemen who did not exist. Okay, and from reports that we hear, we, know, we don't know how accurate uh, they are. And then, uh, even the president, Ashraf Ghani, he was also a Pashtun, by the way. He even as escaped, absconded from Afghanistan, I mean, bringing stacks of uh, money to the extent that when the helicopter was full and he left some because he couldn't take in everything. And, and there's also this infamous photo of the nephew of the president who went to esconded to dubai you know uh, bringing bringing his uh, pet a lion okay pet lion together <laughs> with him so so much money okay especially from uh, america okay went into afghanistan but it didn't uh, go down or benefited the population but mainly Okay, benefited the elites. Okay, and there was widespread corruption. So if you just give money, okay, but without infusing the system with good governance, and I mean that is uh, what you get, and basically people were fed up. Okay, uh, with how the ruling elites of Afghanistan were exploiting them. Okay, and then the third uh, reason I outline here is USA complicity. Okay, USA complicity, okay, which is the deal uh, struck between the Trump administration, okay, which uh, I think Johan also mentioned uh, just now. And if you look into this Washington Post article uh, from 5th September, you can uh, I mean, access it, uh, read it. It's clear okay, that, I mean, the uh, Trump administration had decided that Okay, they could not uh, main, uh, maintain the pre their presence in uh, the uh, in Afghanistan, and I think this was one uh, aspect okay, of uh, foreign uh, for foreign policy, okay, which uh, Trump saw eye, or eye to eye with uh, Biden. Okay, so there was complicity, and uh, I think uh, there should have been more uh, preparedness. And in fact, if you look into the reports, read the reports, I mean, Ashraf Ghani several times complained and complained to the USA, in fact, that he was excluded from the negotiations, even 
Okay, though he was a sitting president, the, the, the USA went to the extent, okay, when the intelligence saw that now this government couldn't last. We are going away, so let the Taliban rule. Okay, and Ashraf Ghani okay, was actually very angry okay, at being left out several times okay, from the negotiations. Okay, next, please. Okay, uh, there's also, in terms of US complicity, okay, whether there is a new uh, combination of forces. And one of the um, agreements purportedly agreed to, okay, uh, by uh, the USA and uh, Taliban is that okay, the Taliban government has to exclude the Islamic State, Khorasan, and Al-Qaeda. So we might be wondering, oh, all of these are terrorists anyway. They are jihadists, whether it's Taliban, ISK, and Al-Qaeda. But between them, okay, there are several differences, even very serious differences. Even between Islamic State and Al-Qaeda, okay, we look into, if, if we have studied the doctrine of all these militant groups, the difference between uh, IS and Al-Qaeda in terms of eschatology, for instance, in terms of the far enemy versus the near enemy, so there are these differences. And of course, between the Taliban okay, and the ISK. Okay. In fact, it's been reported that okay, I mean, Taliban has actually executed some of uh, the leaders of uh, the Islamic State, uh, Khorasan. So there is this uh, article in Der Spiegel. The article is in German. Just use Google to translate it. And you can see how uh, um, the USA purportedly now allies okay, with the French Taliban to strike at Al-Qaeda and Islamic State. Very ironic, very strange. Okay, but this is what uh, is purportedly happening. Okay, uh, and I'm, I'm not saying here that the Taliban are, uh, then has give up, given up jihadism and so on. No, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that in the, the, the USA has changed its strategies and its tactics and also perhaps focusing more okay, towards, uh, you know, the next, uh, I mean, the next uh, confrontation, okay, especially with China as, as they are anticipating. And then there is this US... Uh, a U.S. journalist, uh, sorry, a British journalist, John Pilger. Okay, you can look, look up his uh, YouTube, vi YouTube video here. Okay, and also what he wrote in the Consortium News. News, And he, I mean, openly called okay, the U.S. military a killing machine. The mess they had done okay, in Afghanistan, okay, in fact, uh, indulging in human rights abuses. Uh, which is my next point then. As pointed out, for instance, in this uh, report in the um, in ABC News, some of the human rights abuses committed by the Allied troops. Now, these Allied troops were basically uh, roaming the countryside in search of Taliban. The Taliban are Afghanis. They, okay, uh, I mean, having lost in uh, 2001, they just went back to their uh, villages. And some of them were witch hunted, okay. And uh, you know, just like we see in the films, how the American forces hunted the Viet Cong, okay. And this led to several massacres, even the My, the, the infamous My Lai massacre. And this actually something reminiscent to this, okay, quite similar to this happened in Afghanistan. And it's only now recently, okay, that these human rights abuses. Even people being executed at point blank range, okay, uh, happening in Afghanistan. Yeah, and this is the report is uh, about the crime uh, committed by Australian forces. Okay, and next please. Okay, that, that's all. Okay, so I'd like to uh, thank you for listening, and ho hopefully that can be some. Uh, point, uh, point uh, there could be some points for uh, discussion. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Ozi. Eh? It's a very informative. Uh, 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 so many things eh, that you explained just now. I think probably can already enlighten us eh, about what 
uh, the situation with regard to Taliban, with regard to you know the situation in Afghanistan in terms of ethnic group, and the corruption that you mentioned. I think one of the reason uh, I give uh, by many is that you know because of, uh, too much corruption uh, happened uh, in Afghanistan, which led to the people to support uh, Taliban uh, to and also to bring down the the, the regime uh, of Af uh, Ashraf Ghani in Afghanistan. So actually, there are many questions uh, we can raise uh, to ask you later. So I want to go back to Prof. Johan. Uh, uh, there's so many un uh, unanswered questions. Uh, even uh, at the beginning, also I already raised to you uh, regarding uh, particularly why suddenly Donald Trump uh, decided uh, to, to negotiate uh, with Taliban without the presence of uh, the government uh, of Ashraf Ghani in Afghanistan. Uh, and construct the deal and also sign an agreement uh, in Doha uh, on 29th uh, February 2020. Uh. Uh, is this uh, related to to US itself, uh, which they are already overstretched uh, uh, in terms of capability in helping their ally, also helping countries like Iraq and also Afghanistan? Uh, uh, I'm, what I meant is like this, eh? because according to uh, according to a report, eh? for example, from Brown University, yeah? saying that uh, since 2001 until uh, the last eh? uh, withdrawal of US, actually US spent about $2.3 trillion eh? uh, in Afghanistan alone. Eh? And uh, if we can see the, uh, this eh? in relation to COVID-19, for example, eh? according to Harvard uh, Gazette, eh? Uh, by this uh, this fall, eh? actually US already spent sixteen trillion dollars uh, eh? just to cater for uh, COVID nineteen eh? in in US. Eh? So by looking on this data, say we we can say that you know US already stressed eh? in terms of their financial capability in helping Afghanistan. Is that the reason actually, according to your view, which led to the withdrawal of US and also change of US foreign policy in Afghanistan? What do you think, Prof? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, finally got my video going. Uh, so uh, I think you are right. Uh, you know, the Trump deal was struck rather early. In fact, uh, Prof Fauzi mentioned uh, the negotiations going, negotiations going back as far as 2018, right? So um, it's also, I think it's a, it's, it's a multiplicity of factors, but the underlying, I think, uh, a rationale behind it is that they were Americans, neocons, call them what you will, the establishment basically decided that this was an unwinnable war, right? It's not winnable. So that, that was the underlying sort of reason why uh, it, it, it had to be wound down. Uh, but the way it was wound down was, in, in my view, uh, unethical. I mean, the way it was done was not uh, and take a beyond, beyond all the other things that the Prof. Fauzi talked about in terms of human rights abuse and so on. Uh, because it was, as you say, Ashraf, uh, Ashraf Ghani was not even involved. So there was no real interest in involving uh, even the, uh, the regime that was propped up by America, uh, or is supported by, by, by the Western allies, uh, to be involved in this process. It was almost like a unilateral decision, and that's typical of Trump, right? Trump would have done that, right? Because he was already on this, uh, call it a war path <laughs> of, uh, you know, almost like taking America out of all of these uh, engagements. Uh, and, and in fact, probably it's more of a Trump doctrine than, and then a Biden doctrine. No more, you know, uh, nation building. That was, that was what I mentioned earlier on. Uh, and indeed, you're right, in a sense, uh, the American domestic issues were be becoming very, very prominent. Uh, and, and uh, beyond the debt question, there was the COVID question. I mean, it was huge. I mean, when you remember, America was the number one, right? It, it, it hated the list in terms of how many cases there were, you know, and they, they were not able to deal, especially under Trump, uh, effectively with the, the COVID situation. So all those kinds of questions, I think, did um, uh, cause that, uh, that, that change of heart. But I think the... The, the kind of uh, final seal to that, uh, that, that trend came with Biden, who wanted to, I mean, he spent a huge amount on American infrastructure. He needed the money uh, internally, although I, I, I really, I, I don't understand the economics of uh, US actually. <laughs> you can be a country in debt, well, what is it now, but 14 trillion or something, some ridiculous figure like that. 
uh, and and still carry on. But anyway, uh, and and presumably Afghanistan was was uh, indeed a you know a drain on resources. Uh, but you know America has a way of finding money, like, You know, but uh, still. Uh, because it was such a drain on resources, I think uh, it was necessary to end it there. So just quick answer to your question. Uh, thank you very much. Eh? Now I want to move to uh, Prof. Sheila. Eh? Uh, uh, definitely, eh? I think you also expect uh, this question from me eh? uh, regarding the issue of women, eh? uh, women's rights eh? in uh, Afghanistan. Eh? So even though Taliban eh, already argue that they say that they are changed, eh? they will give opportunity. Eh? For the women to to play their roles, eh? uh, you know, in, in government, in, in politics as well. But so far, what we can see from interim, uh, you know, uh, cabinet eh? that they established none of the women represented. Eh? So uh, that's we. You know, you can talk about politics, but what about the people in general? Eh? Whether Taliban will bring something different this time around, or almost similar like what we saw when they were in power in nineties. Eh? So, what do you think about this? Uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Azizuddin, for the question. And I think to some extent, this question was also picked up uh, by one of our participants, uh, Madam Shanti Dariam. Uh, Shanti, welcome. It's always a pleasure to have you here at, uh, at any of the panels, uh, at the, any programs. Uh, yeah, uh, we have been, you know, if you look at the news, although we need to also be careful with what kind of news that we listen to. But regardless, with regards to women, we are getting news that women are being harassed on the road when they're going to go to work. They're not able to go to work. Or now, uh, the latest that came out, I think was maybe just a few days ago, the Minister of a Higher Education, I think his name is uh, Akami, I, I may be wrong, uh, stated, yes, yes, there will be desegregated uh, education, no more co-educational uh, education within the schools or even at the university. This will be a very big drawback, yeah, because um, since between, uh, in based on the data, the, the trend that I showed earlier in the Human Development Index, yeah, uh, in the year 2000, it was documented there were only like about 5,000 girls in school and after 20 years, uh, the data shows that there are about 3.5 million girls in school. What does, that, what does that show? The fact that the expected year in school would be about uh, 10, about, you know, the expected years of about 10 years, which means that we're having women in the universities, we're having women in the workforce. Now, these are very important for, a, for an economic development of a country but more importantly for the society itself. With regards to education, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, we talk about gender equality, the right to education, uh, the right to education, which means access and participation, the rights within education, which is about gender aware educational environment processes and outcomes. And finally, the rights through education, meaningful education, outcomes that link the education equality to the process of gender justice, meaning that uh, this will have an implication on a lot of things. The well-being of a person, the educational level uh, leading into uh, the, the, the availability of jobs. Although, in terms of jobs, this is another big problem that we're dealing with in Afghanistan. Uh, from 2015, the economic situation has has been going down, has been going downwards. Yeah, It was only uh, even the growth of the economy in the very beginning from 2010 uh, to uh, 20, 2000 until 2015 was actually because there were a lot of troops, uh, you know, uh, and with the number of troops from NATO and with the US, there were a lot of services that need to be given within the country. Once the withdrawal started in 2015, uh, many services were, were, were out. So basically, there's no private sector at all, uh, minimal private sector due to lack of infrastructure, due to lack of uh, legal system, and due to lack of um, uh, the legal system, as well as uh, the, the finance itself. So foreign investment is not coming in. This will, will have an implication on the, the job market, 
and the economic of the country. So this will definitely impact the 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 work scope. Uh, not 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 work scope. The job opportunities for both men and women in the country, as mentioned just uh, earlier, as it is, women are only uh, holding about thirty uh, percent in the labor force participation compared compared to the men. Now, if education is being uh, curbed down, not allowed or uh, or minimal allowed minimally allowed. For, for girls, there are other precautions in a precaution that we're going to see in society. There will be an increase of child marriage, and that has an implication, yeah? implication of health in terms of well-being. Girls will not have financial independence, which means they will have to rely on the male folks in the community. I mean, all of this will actually uh, hinders the development, the overall holistic development in the country. So this is what we're seeing at this point. Um, while the Taliban, by the way, it's interesting, yeah, the word Taliban means student mm. or seeker. And here they are in the position to be able to do something about education. Um, and uh, while they are at the, maybe the top level are saying towards, you know, measuring moderation, but we're not seeing it down, at least not yet, being translated all the way down, even prior to Taliban moving in. Uh, we're getting, uh, uh, there were reports on WhatsApp that, you know, tell the girls not to go to school anymore. I mean, you're hearing all these kind of things. So the, uh, the world is actually watching to what extent the Taliban, who are students or seekers, will actually now govern. And... Uh, <clears throat> on the five, five or six years history that they govern at that point from 1996 to 2001, it was not a, it was, it was a very bad record for girls and education. We would like to see how will that be translated now uh, under, after 20 years uh, being out of governance and let's see, let's see how that is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Prof. Rashila. Now I want to move to Prof. Alzi. Uh, I want to talk or uh, even ask you about Salafism. Uh, because as we know that uh, for the Doha so, uh, for the Doha agreement, eh, so Taliban promise eh, uh, Afghanistan is no longer become safe haven for Al-Qaeda or any terrorist ISIS you know, and the rest. Eh, even though we know that uh, ISIS Khorasan is existing there. Eh. So uh, what I want to ask you, eh, uh, what we understand about Taliban, eh, they also embrace uh, Salafism. Eh? So whether they can uphold of this agreement, you know, uh, we, uh, you know, we meaning that they're going to fight against the other Salafis, you know, uh, in, the, in the name of ISIS, for example, or Al Qaeda, and whether this can change the dynamic in the Central uh, Asia, eh? because we know that uh, bordering of the of the country is just Iran. Eh? So how Iran will respond to this because uh, as a Shia state, you know, uh, Shia dominated state. Eh? So probably they might worry about uh, the situation in Afghanistan. So what do you take in overall in terms of Salafism and also the dynamic in that region when uh, Taliban uh, came back into power? Okay, uh, thank you, okay, Prof. Uh, Azizuddin for the question okay, and, the, uh, and, and the observation. Now, if we were to categorize uh, Taliban, you know, what sort of uh, Islamist uh, ideology do they adhere to? They are, there are some aspects of Salafism, but there are also aspects distinctive of um, in subcontinent uh, Deobandism, okay, I think. Now, if you look at this, the more appropriate group to be termed Salafi in the context of the Indian subcontinent uh, is a group called the Ahli Hadith. Okay, you can Google the, the Ahli Hadith, I think, who are more rigid uh, Salafis. Okay, but uh, having said that, okay, the Obandis, uh, for instance, generally, okay, they abhor uh, the so-called uh, shirk, politism, and bid'as uh, done by, allegedly done by the Sufis. Okay, same as the mm -hmm. Salafis. Uh, okay, okay, and this, this is one of the reasons of so of the 
uh, growth of uh, Deobandi uh, I mean, activism. And there are articles written on whether uh, Deobandis are really uh, anti-Sufi, because there are also scholars who argue that Ingram, for instance, whom I mentioned, okay, that uh, rather than uh, being anti-Sufi per se, they're actually more interested in getting Sufism down from the uh, world of the uh, awliya, the peers, okay, as you call them in, uh, in South Asia, to, uh, to ground it okay, on the uh, in grassroots uh, population. So Sufism becomes uh, something which is very non-elitist, very uh, down to earth. Okay, but then there's, there's an aspect also of Deobandism, which is perhaps uh, not in agreement with Salafism per se, because okay, they are not la mazhabi, okay, they are not anti-mazhab. Okay, they adhere to um, in the Hanafi school of law, for instance. Okay, whereas uh, most uh, okay, Salafis okay, will say that uh, it, it, is, it is better to adhere directly to the Quran and Sunnah. Rather, rather than uh, to ad rather than adhering to any of uh, the one uh, sc schools of uh, fake, okay, whether it's Shafi'i, Hanbali, uh, Hanafi, or Maliki, and Hanafi is the dominant uh, school of Islamic law okay, in uh, South Asia. So they do adhere to one, one particular school of law, and in that aspect, it's quite different from Salafism. Uh, but then the new development, which arose okay, in especially the 1980s okay, after, the, after the Soviet occupation okay, of Afghanistan is that the flow of U.S. money into Afghanistan, and this is something real. Okay. In fact, I was in a conference, I think, four years ago okay, with the former foreign minister of Afghanistan. It's called the Russia Islamic World Strategic Meeting. So I, I, I mean, represented Malaysia then. Okay, and the Afghan rep was the former foreign minister of Afghanistan. And I asked him directly whether U.S. money was funneled to these madrasas. And he said, yes. Okay, and it, it, it mostly went to the militant ones. Okay, so you say that okay, U.S. was against jihadism, but it was U.S. money that was fueling okay, some of these militant ideologies, which I think contributed very much to radicalizing some of this normative I um, mean, Deobadi Madrasas into radical ones. Okay, not just US money, but also, I mean, uh, I mean Saudi money. Okay, and Saudi money injecting, I um, mean, Salafi Wahhabism okay, into, uh, okay, in, into the curriculum of some of these uh, Madrasas. Okay, and uh, uh, some of the Taliban leaders were actually educated in these Madrasas. Okay, you can Google Mullah Omar, for instance. Okay, was educated in one of these uh, Diobandi uh, madrasas. Okay, and there's another madrasa, Madrasa Hakania, okay, in Peshawar, Pakistan. Okay, also responsible for educating many of these uh, I mean, I mean, Taliban leaders. And one reason okay, for I mean, their imbibing this so-called so fighting spirit or jihadism okay, is because their I mean, uh, country Afghanistan was being colonized. Okay, we just imagine if we are Malaysians, we go and take, take shelter in Indonesia, and what do we feel? Okay, uh, don't we feel responsible to take back uh, our country for? And for these Afghanistan, three million of them, okay, I was saying, okay, mostly scattered along the border of the Af Afghanistan uh, Pakistan uh, uh, border, which is Pashtun territory. Okay, and a lot of the Pakistanis are Pashtuns as well. Okay, they are uh, Pashtun uh, brothers and uh, brothers and sisters in ethnicity. See, so uh, I mean, the West also accuses Pakistan, okay, of uh, helping, okay, in terms of not just money, but in terms of training, okay, and, and so on, okay, of uh, some of these uh, militants who then go on, okay, into uh, Afghanistan too. Um, liberate their country. I mean, India. I mean, accuses Pakistan of sheltering or even training. Okay, some of these uh, terrorists who then who then go on to fight in Kashmir. Okay, and then I think um, uh, important an important minority group. Okay, in uh, Afghanistan. Okay, 
which uh, has been uh, sidelined and marginalized all this while are the Hazaras. They are Shias. And there are many of them now taking shelter, not just in Iran, but in Iraq. Okay, because the Iraqi, I mean, it's also a Shia majority country now, I mean, having a Shia government and so on. Okay, and there are reports of many of, many of them now fearing a return to I mean, Afghanistan. Okay, because the Taliban are notorious okay, for having uh, killed and massacred uh, in the past okay, uh, a lot of uh, Hazaris. And this is also an aspect of uh, Salafism, especially Salafi jihadism a la ISIS. If you look at the origin of ISIS, Abu Masam al zarqawi okay, in Iraq, okay, most of his early attacks and massacres were not against uh, the U.S. forces per se, but were against the Shia minority. Okay, that means the Shias in, in Iraq. Okay, and I think the anti shiism of the Salafis, and this is one thing which I think the uh, Taliban inherited okay, from this um, broad Salafi uh, education is, uh, is I mean, a, a feeling of hatred towards the Shias. Okay, in fact, even in the new government, okay, there were no Hazara representatives. And I think okay, in Iran uh, being an important power in the Muslim world, I think this is uh, some, uh, I mean, import, an important aspect okay, of the still exclusive nature okay, of uh, Talibanism okay, that I think the Muslim world as a whole it has got to address. Because whether you like it or not, I mean, Shias are human beings. Okay? And in fact, I've, I've been to conferences in Iran, in Tehran twice. Okay? I've been there. Okay? And I've met even Sunnis over there. Okay, who came and uh, greeted me because they saw me wearing the song They know people from Southeast Asia are Sunnis. And they are Sunnis. Okay, and they, 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 I mean, they live normally in Iran. And perhaps there was persecution, perhaps in the early days of the Iranian Revolution. But now but no, there are many Sunnis okay, living even in Tehran itself. Okay, and they acknowledge you when they see that you are, you are Sunni. So if Sunnis, uh, I think, can be given human rights, to uh, practice, okay, uh, although within limited bounds, okay, uh, I mean their uh, beliefs and uh, I mean the beliefs and, and practices in, in, in Iran, okay, there is no reason okay, why uh, Sunni uh, countries, Sunni nations should be that okay, uh, rigid, okay, and and and, and especially uh, and especially it will be it will be deplorable okay, if uh, the Taliban would I um, mean renew. Okay, they are intense hatred okay, of the Asia community. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof. Hozi. Yeah. Uh, now, I think we are moving to uh, the last round. Eh? Meaning that I open for the Q&A eh, uh, from our viewers. And actually, I already got many questions eh, uh, from our mm. viewers here. Uh, <laughs> so, I try to group them up eh, into several questions. Okay. One, I think, uh, I think this goes to everybody. Uh, but uh, I think probably I want to ask uh, Prof. Uh, Johan eh, uh, to answer this question. Eh. This is coming from Bon and also Ahmad Jibril. Eh. Because more or less uh, the same question that they asked. Eh. So will the Taliban eh, be accepted by the international community? Uh, what's the pro and cons? Eh? Uh, if Taliban be accepted by the international community, especially from the pro-US uh, countries? Eh? And how the panel... Uh, saw China's uh, willingness to work with the Taliban. Eh? So, Prof. John, can you answer that question? Hey, thank you. Yeah, I think uh, I, I did put it up on my slide, the recognition of the Taliban. As of now, of course, uh, uh, the, you know, the UN recognizes the, the, old, the old government. And so it will be up against that kind of thing. And Malaysia itself, I think our foreign minister, uh, Saifuddin uh, Abdullah mentioned that uh, he's, he hasn't said anything about recognition, but he's waiting for the signals from the UN body and so on. So I think it will be a, a, a period of time before this recognition uh, will take place, uh, particularly among the West. I think it'll be a very long time uh, before the Western countries will recognize it. But I can see a, a, a shift probably. Uh, and given that China is already engaging directly with uh, with the Taliban government, uh, there will be 
uh, countries that are aligned to China, let's say, right, or is close to China, would probably also take the cue. Uh, you know, you can have a relationship without an actual recognition. So you may not have a seat in the UN, but there, there are engagements and relationships. You remember the days when you have the Cambodian government? Uh, there were two Cambodian governments uh, for a very long time. And uh, the ASEAN group of countries were recognizing one particular group of uh, one particular government, when in fact, the government that was in power, which is the, the government now, right, uh, was the one that was not recognized by ASEAN. You know, it's a very long story. So you might get a situation of that, but it will take a bit of time for, for, for this kind of thing to, uh, to, take, uh, to happen, right? Uh, but can I just pop, uh, pop on to another question? Because it's, I see it here. It's a, a question by Sharifah Mahajis. Then the rest of the time, I think uh, Prof. Fauzi and uh, Rashida can take it up. Because this is a question that's posed by Sharifah Munira. Uh, and it's an important one, uh, is the, if the uh, just beyond the recognition thing and the role of the Western powers in, in the region, do we see an end of the, uh, the hegemonic project of the US, let's say, right? I mean, is this the end of it? I, I did sort of hint at it in my presentation that this, we are in a very fluid period where you see uh, the major hegemon of the world, which is a superpower of the world, of the, of the world today, the US, United States of America, right? I mean, you compare... Uh, it from, from a hard power point of view, the, the, the China is nowhere close to the US in terms of its, uh, its, you know, its military capability and all that. So I think the uh, major hegemon uh, in, in, in our region would continue to be US, but the kind of politics that it will play, the kind of relationships it will have with the uh, regional states will be different now. So I think uh, there, is a, there will be an, a new calibration of the way in which uh, the US will have engagements in terms of its alliances and so on. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, increasingly, I think uh, people, uh, countries in the region, whether it's Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia, because this also has implications for Southeast Asia, Malaysia, there was a question about Malaysia, what does this mean? Uh, will have to be a bit more measured in terms of their relationships with major powers. And Malaysia actually has been quite good on this score. I mean, I, mm. I'm on record on saying, uh, we do have hedged this diplomacy. We play that sort of uh, politics, which is necessary in this current period of a very fluid global uh, major power politics. Uh, so I think uh, Afghanistan points to another, I think, movement towards that kind of politics. And we have to look out, Badikari, we have to look out after ourselves and, yes. and maybe sort of keep uh, the, the, the major powers, including the US and even China, uh, you know, at some distance and, and manage our own our own politics that way. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, I think I also got many questions for Prof. Fauzi actually. But yeah. I think I uh, want to right now pass to Prof. Sheila for us. You know? uh, because uh, there's a question also to Prof. Fauzi in regard to media propaganda. Even just now you, you touched a little bit yeah? uh, that we have to be aware about the media reports. Huh? Uh, in the news, everything with regard to this issue. So probably, can you respond to this in terms of media propaganda? Uh, what we can, uh, you know, how we can deal with this uh, propaganda? Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Prof. Okay, good. Okay, I'll pick it up. Okay, you can. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, okay, uh, my take on this is that I, I think I just mentioned it a little bit just now. I think the fact that we need to be very careful in terms of uh, what news to believe, what news, uh, uh, the sources, the sources of the news that we need to believe. We must always uh, double check, double check. If we are reading from one particular source, we need to check through two or three other sources in order to ensure that the data we're getting uh, is the correct one. For example, I mentioned just now, just even trying to get the, the kind of exact population of um, Afghanistan, I've seen data from 35 million all the way to 40 million because mm. the fact that there was not a proper census that was really done in the country. So these are the things that we need to be very aware when we are reading, uh, when, when, we're, when we are trying to look into the, into the sources, yeah? uh, the, the, the credibility of the reporter. Uh, in terms of the sources itself. So I, I, I think, uh, yeah, I think that would be my response at this point. Thank you. Okay, uh, probably uh, Prof. Fauzi also can respond uh, to that. And also at the same time, respond to uh, Prof. Sharfra Munira, eh, also mentioning all, all the answer actually by Prof. Jahat, but please you can respond to that as well. 
Uh, okay. Um, uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, Azizuddin. Okay, I think as uh, Prof. Rashila mentioned just now, I think we need to check our uh, sources, and I think the uh, the respected doctor who questioned okay, will know what uh, in uh, Arabic is tabayun. You know, the, the checking of uh, sources okay, before you verify a, a particular uh, fact, and especially in the age of the uh, internet, and we are in sort of a free uh, for all. There are so many things there. You, like, you get exhausted if you want to read each and every one of, of the reports from all uh, shades of uh, opinion. Okay, and, and it's very important, I think, for us as, as scholars, for those of us who are scholars or academics over here, okay, uh, to not just rely on media reports, okay, but to also consult uh, scholarly uh, sources, for instance, as I mentioned uh, on Diobandism, for instance, not to just rely on the Washington Post or New York Times. Unfortunately, especially for webinars like this, where we are invited in on short notice, that's, that's the reports that we have to rely on. But in the long term, as scholars, we have to go to, I think, scholarly uh, articles and uh, theses okay, and books and, and so on. Okay? I mean, so that our uh, views and uh, opinions Okay, becomes uh, multi uh, faceted, okay, and also we're able to dissect uh, concepts, okay, and uh, to explain uh, things based on okay informed, uh, okay, based on informed reading that we have we have uh, made. I think for scholars, then can it, it's it's I mean uh, there's a lot of whole of uh, things that we uh, have to do, and especially consulting uh, the academic sources. If you, if you, if we rely okay, on the general public to do that, okay, even an academic article of twenty pages, they probably take one month, even more than that, to finish that. Okay, because that is their capability. Okay, but then uh, for as academics or, or scholars, if we ourselves can rely. Um, basically on just media reporting and that informs what we write in our academic pieces. I think it, it's, it's, I mean, I think uh, we have failed okay, in, 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 our, in our responsibility okay, as uh, an academic. And can I take this opportunity, I think, to address uh, one question by Adlina Sulaiman, okay, the one before this okay, yes. as, as, as well. Okay, on the uh, women thing. No, I think I wasn't saying that we need not be apprehensive okay, of the uh, so-called uh, new Taliban. Okay, and we seem to be apprehensive sometimes of whether it's uh, new Taliban or new Malaysia or new this and new that. And many things actually are not very new, although <laughs> they are claimed uh, to be new. So I think I also mentioned that now there are roots of this uh, Taliban ideology, which I think are still there. But because they are the ones in power, okay, and uh, many uh, people have come to the uh, opinion or to the conclusion that, well, let's have them in power, engage them, and let's persuade them to have an inclusive government. I mean, Saifuddin Abdullah, as Prof. Johan was mentioning, uh, said that a few days ago, in, even Imran Khan, Okay, well, who is the next door neighbor to Afghanistan also mentioned that. Okay, okay. but and it won't be easy. Okay, especially looking at the background okay, of the, I mean, uh, Taliban ministers and uh, and deputy ministers. But but what uh, alternative do we have? Okay, and, and I think for NGOs and for academic institutions, UKM, USM, mention whatever. It's important now to study this country. And I think this is a very neglected state. I took South Asian politics as one of my papers and at the undergraduate level. This was, this was 30 years ago at Oxford. I remember, okay, studying India. I wrote an essay on India. I studied Bangladesh. I wrote an essay on Bangladesh. I studied Pakistan, wrote an essay on Pakistan and Sri Lanka, okay, where Johan's ancestors are from. <laughs> okay, I wrote I wrote an essay on Sri Lanka. 
But there was nothing on Afghanistan. It was neglected, even in the syllabus. Okay, so I passed the politics of South Asia course without knowing anything okay, of, 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 on Afghanistan. And this was during, during the following days of the, uh, during the dying days of the Soviet empire in, in the early 1990s. Okay, so I don't know whether, I mean, in UKM, you have ICON, you have Latin American studies, and I don't know. I mean, in, has, the, has the time come, for instance, for us to create experts who know more about South Asia, who know more about the Indian subcontinent? And I think of, for me, this is one of the uh, sad things about uh, the social science neglecting area studies. Because area studies has been defeated. Okay, if you look at uh, many things uh, written, yeah, uh, I mean, area studies has been defeated by disciplinary studies. Yeah, and people now have to become either a political scientist or a sociologist or an anthropologist, okay, without some even without defining an area of uh, specialization. Whereas in the old days, you can become, you know, a specialist in one country and you know everything about that country. Okay, and, and, and at even in Western universities, sadly, okay, there has been a cut, a cut in a scaling down of funding even in Asia Pacific Studies, you go to ANU, for instance. Okay, the Asia I mean, Pacific School of Asia Pacific Studies. I think uh, they uh, they're suffering from cuts in uh, budget and so on. And I'm afraid that again, you know, this will create uh, more disciplinary uh, centric uh, scholars who actually don't appreciate the particular distinctiveness of uh, an area or a uh, or country. That's why I think from us Malaysian scholars, we need, okay, uh, if we are to engage in the long term okay, on uh, this country, I um, mean, Afghanistan, especially for, for, there are some people in Malaysia who are of Afghan ancestry, for instance. I think in Klantan, in Pase Mas, okay, uh, okay, I mean, they are uh, I mean, and, and descendants of this Afghan uh, textile. Okay, I mean textile, not manufactured, yeah. but textile sellers. Okay, in 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 Klantan. For 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 some of us, I mean Afghanistan okay, will be a very interesting uh, country uh, to study, and whether it has it, it is now the time, okay, uh, to put an effort to create a department of South Asian studies studying all the countries of uh, of um in, of the Indian subcontinent. I don't know. It is very important, I think, for us, okay, especially since, uh, I mean, not just the Afghanis, but I mean, our Tamil community, the Indian community, uh, I mean, Silonis uh, community, I mean, we have roots there, okay, and, and, and Tamils have been here since the Malaccan Empire, okay, and as, as some of the case, okay, and uh, some of the, uh, I mean, figures, the Bandaharas of the uh, Malaccan Empire were actually Tamil Muslims, but we call them Lays, but they were actually Tamil Muslims. Abdullah Munshi was a basically a, a, a Tamil Muslim. Yeah. Okay, so I think studying South Asia has become uh, more important for us, and, and we need to understand this, especially in terms of the culture, culture towards women and so on, how difficult it is for them to adapt to this. Okay, I'm not saying that what they are doing are right or what the Taliban are doing are right, are correct in terms of uh, their attitude towards women and so on. But only, only when we understand their society, their culture, okay, can we persuade them to change. Thanks. Thank you, Prof. Uh, actually, we still have time until 12. Eh? We're supposed to finish by 12. But uh, with me right now, uh, I think two last questions. Eh? Uh, that I can ask. This is uh, for any one of you uh, to answer. I think the uh, one of the questions from Arya Tan, I think, which is very interesting. Uh, uh, the, uh, the the question is: uh, What are Malaysia's uh, interests in Afghanistan? What is the nature of previous bilateral relations, and what are the potential for future engagement of Malaysia there? What are the potential application of developments there for Malaysia in terms of ideologies, geopolitics, and security? So. Any of you can answer this question? I don't know uh, who wants to start. Oh, please, oh, Johan, maybe you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, can you, you know, on your mic, oh, Johan? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Prof. Aziz, for the question. It's from Ariel Tan. Yes, uh, I think um, 
it's important what 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 Prof Housey said. I think is super important. I think uh, we have to uh, take off our political science hats every now and then or song course and become anthropologists or become cultural specialists. Uh, I think we really need to understand the region better. Uh, and you know, uh, I I'm, I myself am a political international relations, so I, I tend to look at the big picture. But I yeah. think you really need to have this this very sort of close understanding, and that addresses the question. Which is, I think, um, we, we we are not sufficiently engaged in the region to understand the kind kind of politics that's taking place. So this webinar has helped me understand quite a lot of what I didn't know in the in the first place. I mean, the whole South Asia region, the Central Asia region, is uh, with rife with all kinds of issues and 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 problems, which I think are very relevant to us. Uh, not just uh, from a, a cultural or you know a regional perspective, but uh, in, in a very real way. So I think in terms of the immediate uh, uh, situation now, uh, you have a you have now a Taliban government. When I think, just like I said about Cambodia, it will develop in that direction. You will have to engage. So in order to to be able to engage, you will have to understand better uh, the situation. I think one of our ministers did say. Uh, uh, what's his name? Zuraida said uh, we should actually go there and uh, you know help women to get empowered. What do you think, Rashila? Uh, Malaysians should actually go in and get uh, you know involved in some of these things. And certainly we could use uh, we could use the UN as as the basis for our engagement, which is exactly what happened in Cambodia. Go back to Cambodia. Yeah, after the fall of uh, you know Vietnam and all that, Cambodia became a almost like a UN state. You know the, the the white flags of the UN or the, the you know the, the vehicles were everywhere, and in fact the whole democratization process was ushered in by by the UN with the participation of the ASEAN countries as well as like-minded countries which were you know interested in it. So I think the same sort of policy must be carried out. Uh, yes. Could ASEAN, for example, start to think a little bit about this and and and, and yeah. begin to engage? Uh, a little, a little more deeply in, uh, in, in, uh, you know, in, in Afghanistan and in, in, in Central Asia. So there are many, many uh, questions and issues. I think we will have to think about. So Malaysia directly, our, our, our foreign minister has said something which is okay. I mean, acceptable. We will wait for the kinds of signals that should come from the UN, and we can participate in this engagement with the new Afghanistan uh, regime, government, call it what you will, uh, using those kinds of platforms. Uh, okay, well, for Johan, I think I also got several other questions, but I think all these questions already answered by oh. all our panelists. Uh, there's the last question, which is, I think, uh, is, is a very quite direct question from P3, Sukri. Eh? Uh, could there be a proxy war between US back Qatar yeah. and China back Pakistan in the Taliban organization? As there seem to be two groups of Taliban, eh? uh, pro uh, Qatar and pro Pakistan uh, Taliban. Uh, I'm not sure who uh, can answer this question. Prof. Fauzi, you take it. Uh. Can you repeat that, Prof. Uh, could there be a proxy war between US back Qatar and China back Pakistan in the Taliban organization as there seem to be two groups of Taliban, eh? pro Qatar and pro Pakistan Taliban? In there are two groups uh, which is aligned to uh, foreign countries as well in, within Taliban. So, would you, just like I chip in, would you say, uh, and, and the question is actually to everybody, would you say that the, the you know, what is called it, uh, the Taliban, uh, which is based in Pakistan, is different from the, the, the Taliban that is currently now in power in, in, in Afghanistan? Is that, is, that, uh, is that your understanding, Prof. Hausi? And would that therefore lead to this? I, I'm also, you know, pushing yeah. in that question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, would that bro, be a conflict there? And uh, you have so to you start, Prof. Yeah, uh, we are now reaching 12, and uh, I said just now that uh, Prof, Prof Rajila wanted to say something. So, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. uh, uh, well, I'm not going to answer the other question, but there was another question that came out with regards to uh, are there any Malaysian NGOs uh, uh. In, uh, in Afghanistan? I think this is by uh, Ariel Tan. Yeah? Uh, as far as we know, there yeah, are a few, but... Um, I think one of the, the latest one is actually on global peace mission, uh, which was actually uh, that came up recently looking for donations and so on. But I just want to touch on the bigger role of NGOs. Through that 20 years, 
No, there were many NGOs, international, especially international NGOs, and okay. they are the ones that were really driving the development within uh, Afghanistan. And we see, for example, uh, Save the Children, we see Help the Refugees, many, many different NGOs within, within the, 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 the countries. And development in Afghanistan was based on grants. It's really not on private uh, sector investment. So I think this is, I just would like to say a couple of things here. This is an opportunity actually for the new Taliban government to show what they can yeah. do, maybe pragmatically. They have already engaged with China, but what other, they, they really need help in terms of uh, capacity building to have a very good civil servant, civil service in the country. They also need all the technical expertise in the economic realm. Uh, and being a member of WTO, they can actually access capability, uh, capacity building for uh, legal economic structures and so on to be put in place. Now, that, that leads me to one final point, which is on us, the role of ASEAN. I think there are many good things in ASEAN that we can actually share with uh, the, the new government. Uh, for example, with constructive uh, engagement that we have done with Myanmar to this year's, uh, regardless of uh, some of the effect, but still, uh, that would be something that can be taken in. At the same time, uh, the concept of uh, the zone for peace, freedom, and neutrality. These are the things that maybe uh, uh, the Afghanistan can actually uh, pick up because of the strategic location that they are in and the neighbors that they do have. So, uh, so these are the things that we need to put forth. Uh, one last, last, last thing with regards to uh, area studies. This is very important because, uh, yeah, mentioned also the word of ICON and so on. I was a director of ICON at one stage, uh, but then we restructured into ICMAS. And we do have a program on MENA, yeah? uh, Middle East, North African studies, so, but not on South Asia. But I think uh, area studies has actually expanded into what is called another term, yeah? new area studies where the, con the context is more on multidisciplinary approach to different areas. So. These are areas definitely we need to look into and it will help the country in so many ways to understand the different cultures uh, in order to make better policies for the society. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Rashila. Now just I pass to very quick. Yeah? Prof. Aizuddin, just very briefly because we are past time now. So that, yeah. uh, I mean, 12 o'clock. I think I won't go into the business of being a... Uh, uh, soothsayer, okay, or forecaster, whether there will be a proxy war or not. But this is a question of politics. And in politics, many things can happen. In fact, anything can happen. And teams, uh, combinations and permutations can change and change quite very easily. As, for instance, the Taliban okay, change, for instance, from being a shelterer of Al-Qaeda okay, to being a hunter of Al-Qaeda uh, okay, as part of their in agreement uh, inked with uh, the USA, for instance. So even the Deobandis came from whom the, uh, I mean, I mean the Taliban's ide ideologically originated, they differ when they are in Pakistan and India. Of course, but the Taliban's in pa Afghanistan and uh, Pakistan differ. Now, even those in the Deobands in uh, India, for instance, supported a secular state. They were pro-India. You can look at Maulana Ahmad Hussein Madani. Okay? I mean, before, before partition, he was anti-partition. He was against Pakistan. And this is one of the top Deobandi scholars. But when the Deobandi, the Deobandi scholars in Pakistan, they were for the Islamic State. Uh, because Zia ul Haq, okay, when he was president of uh, Pakistan, supported many of the Deobandi madrasas. So the policies were different, even though they came from, they, they, they were, this was sourced from a similar Islamist ideology, but yet in uh, India, the, the uh, Deobandi ulama in India and the Deobandi ulama in Pakistan had different policies, policies with, with regard to politics. And this is politics, I think. It can differ and it's, it's pragmatic. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Then I think that's all. Eh? Uh, 
from us eh? and uh, one actually i learned a lot uh, today i think also my, our view, viewers eh, also learn a lot about afghanistan uh, even though it's within just two hours but i think i learned so many things which i not cover actually eh, by news media or other session that i attend, attended uh, before eh? so i want to express my gratitude eh, to all panelists uh, prof johan uh, prof Sheila, and so prof Fauzi, eh? uh, hopefully one day we can also have a similar kind of program uh, like this and enlighten our, our viewers, our, our, our people eh, about the, the scenario uh, issues that we cover like, like today, which is, which is about Afghanistan. Eh. So I want also to uh, say thank you eh, to Academy Professor Malaysia for organizing this uh, uh, forum and hope to see you all again in probably another uh, similar program like this in the future. Eh. So thank you very much and see you next time. Eh. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, can you? Bye. Okay. Can, can we really open our? Thank our you. Uh, please, uh, oh, picture. Take on your camera, please. Photo, yeah. yeah. Yeah, for group photo, please. Yeah. Uh, take on your camera. Right. Okay. Right. One, two. Yeah. Uh, turning on camera. All right. One, two, three. For the second page, okay. One, two. All right, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.